it all kind of started when I met Barney at, yeah. at the one of the four drive shows in 2018. And we, I was just, because I'm still a fan of everything. Like, I still, yeah. like, you know, having you rock up today, I was like, oh, fuck, that's Ruthie. <laughs> you know, like, but it's like. Jeez, he's fat and old. <laughs> <laughs> And I appreciate you stopping there because I know how busy you are and fitness in is awesome. Mate, I actually, I, I, I love what you do. I've had a, had, a, had a look. I had a yarn to a few people. Okay. She's all good. All so right, so we passed the yarn test. <laughs> you passed the you passed the Ruthie test, yeah. Nice. That doesn't mean a lot. No, uh, well. <laughs> I well, hang out with all sorts of lowlifes. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't started, have you, Sean? Oh, it be, yeah, that's all, it's all good. Don't even stress. <laughs> Don't even stress. Okay. Oh, that's cool. There was actually, there was one. Oh, what were we talking about? We were talking about bikes earlier. And uh, uh, the, I think there was a, a photo you posted. Uh, might have been on Facebook. Uh, there it is. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's like, <laughs> you, look, you look like, you, 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 you look like the, the part in that <laughs> one. I was, that, lo- I was looking at the angle that you're on there and you're about a bee's dick away from scraping something. Oh, it's drifting. Yeah. It's drifting. It's... um. That's when they bought the Springer out, 1992. Yeah. And that was the first one in the country. Yeah. And um, uh, I was working for two wheels at testing bikes and we had a, another magazine called Live to Ride. So we borrowed it to test it for two wheels and I did it all with leathers, you know. Yeah. Two wheels written all over them and a full face helmet. Yeah. And then I went back did the same corner with no helmet and a, no and a yeah. Bon Jovi jacket yeah. <laughs> so we could get some shots for Live to Ride. That's so by r- the time that came up, I'd done that corner 30 times. <laughs> and, uh, That's a ripper shot. I could do it. <laughs> that is a ripper shot. Oh, I love bikes. Love oh, bikes. It's, um, yeah, I've got, uh, that was one of the things that the early years was, was me, uh, you know, growing up watching like the American Chopper and stuff like yeah. that. That's what, that, that was one of yeah. the fabrication bugs. Got me was, sure. was watching them do all that in the sheet metal. and um, But someone said to me years ago, well, don't open a bike shop, you'll go broke. Open something else that'll pay the bills and you can, <laughs> and you can play with bikes. And, uh, well, <laughs> Look but, at uh, that's, yeah. that's pretty much my story, actually. That's um, I was a bike journo yeah. having a ball, yeah. going all over the world, testing bikes, getting paid about, you know, $200 a year or something. Not, <laughs> not a lot. Yeah. And... Um, uh, and I was quite happy till I was about 37. Then I got married and pretty soon I had a wife and some kids. Yeah, yeah. And, man, I had to make some more money. So um, I hopped in. I love four-wheel drives, obviously, so that was a real easy move. Yeah. And at the same time I was working for caravan magazines and all sorts of stuff. And, yeah. and that just all took off, that yeah. whole off-road lifestyle thing. Yeah. You know, it's like it's like being up the back of the waves and the big one comes through and you're the only one there. Yeah. It was perfect. Yeah, well, I saw that um, the the, the fir- you, you did a post, uh, for, it was a couple of years ago, but it was the, the first video post and you boys were up, uh, uh, not the gala, um, God, where were you? Old mate was doing most of the talking in the beginning and it was a... Pat. Yeah. Pat, yeah. It, was, it took me a second, I was like, who's this? Like, why, where's Ruth, <laughs> why isn't Ruthie talking? And it got into it a bit, but it was the, the that was like I think the first one for the magazine, the first uh, show. It was a video. Your first it wasn't video even for a the DVD, magazine. yeah. No, yeah. And so and where did would they have, where would that have come out? Was that on Pat, TV? Oh no no no! It came out. Um, how did it come out? That's a good question. Uh, it must have been a uh, a gift with. You send in. You bought the magazine. You got the something like that. I don't remember, but. Um, before long, they got converted to DVDs and then they were on the cover, so yeah. that was always easy. Yeah. But the, um, the the story behind that's pretty simple, really. I was a tour guide working for a mob called Aussie Motorcycle Adventures. Okay. Just, just uh, um, what would you call it, one of the, one of the many jobs. Yeah. Part, part yeah. of motorcycling, you yeah. take everything you can. Yeah. And uh, mucking around in the bush with Japanese mostly and Germans. Lots of interesting stories there. We <laughs> probably won't go into too many of them. But um, uh, and then I started working for Four Wheel Drives so just as a freelancer. I've always been a freelancer. Yeah. And um, Pat was a – he's a lovely bloke, but he was a city guy, you yeah. know. Went to school in the city and all that. And, and he needed someone who knew the outback and that was me. Right. So – and I had a beard, which yeah. really helped. Yeah, yeah. And that's what happened. The cameraman – on one of the early trips, said, hey, who's the bloke over there? You know, like, 
the, doing the cooking, we'll get him in too. Yeah. And um, and that's how it happened. And then eventually they sacked Pat for other reasons, nothing to do with he wasn't good at his job, he was. Yeah. And, um, and I just kind of stepped into the role, basically. It was all an accident. It was a complete accident. The only thing that wasn't <clears throat> was Milo because um, – I'd worked with machines all my life, one way or another. Bobcats yep. and trucks and stuff, you know. Yeah. And um, once I started the doing tours with four wheel drive action, yep. or, which was four wheel drive monthly. monthly yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. It was just a job. So the machine has to be cheap. Yeah. Has to be cheap to run. Maintenance is everything, you know. Uh, that's why four cylinder diesel. Straight in and yep. old troop carrier. It's nearly six hundred bucks involved in that first truck. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, cost me nothing. Run all over the world, just uh, fantastic. So yeah, it's a, it's an I mean, it's an iconic one, and you're obviously iconic with that with that model as well. And yeah, everything because I mean, it was it was Milo one, Milo two, and mustard, and they're both they're both in uh, the two Milos. They're in. Um, uh, what do you call them? Uh, museums. <laughs> well, yeah, not quite. Um, no. Milo one is Milo yeah. one. They asked, which is the Milo everyone knows, the yeah. cut down trophy. Yeah, um, <clears throat> it's in the National Transport Museum down in uh, Adelaide. That's it. Yeah, uh, in what's it called? I can't think of it. Just outside of Adelaide, um, the mill, and and the government asked for it. Which was amazing. That's great. I mean, normally they just ask for your money, you know. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I'd just reached a stage where Milo had um, probably just over a million Ks. Yeah. Like I've got a row of Speedos, they're all broken. Yeah. It had 200,000 on it when I started on it. And, um, and she was stuffed, you know. Like I used yeah. to put her on the hoist, the doors would fly open on their own. <laughs> I'd, I'd fish plated the chassis three times. Yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I had steam pipe holding the front bearers together. I had uh, <clears throat> the body was just you had to shut the doors and wire them up, you know, yeah. so they didn't spring open. Um, she was just flogged out. It was nothing a new body, a new chassis, and all new mechanicals wouldn't fix, but <laughs> wouldn't be the same truck, would it? Well, no. You know? In no. fact, the only thing I kept out of it was the headlights. They were good LED ones. So <laughs> yeah, right. I put some old bulbs back in, but. And is it the was it the colour that got the name or the or the name that it's by the colour? Because I heard through the grapevine that it was there was a Milo tin that either had something to do with a snorkel or exhaust. <laughs> that, that was where the name come from. So where, where did it come from? Okay, well, oh, you you don't want to know the real reason. Come <laughs> on, um, no. that's, oh. that's what the edit's for. <laughs> <laughs> well, basically, basically, uh, everything I got if I take it in the bush, I paint it green. Right. That's number one. And the reason for that is because I don't pay for accommodation or camping, you know. Right. So I'm a big believer in just pulling off the side of the road and getting behind a bunch of trees and camping, you know. Couldn't agree more. Done it all over the place. Don't believe in paying for it. Yeah. And um, – Green disappears a bit. And green disappears. Yes. And so uh, basically there was another side to this too, which is I'd always had Land Rovers. Yep. I'm almost ashamed to admit that. <laughs> I had Toyotas in the tour business, yep. 75 series – um, but my own fun trucks were Land Rovers. Right. You know, like Stratty or yep. whatever. They're just old army jinkers and yeah, for play sure. with them. And, um, but I knew that if we were going to be doing this video caper, I needed a bit more reliability and long distance, which meant Toyota at that stage. Yeah, yeah. And nothing was more iconic than that shape. No. So, but you asked why Milo. Um, it's mostly because... It was like being in a tin can. <laughs> you know, it rattled and shook, and yeah, well, yeah. I felt like a milkshake, fair dinkum, you yeah. know. Like, uh, yeah, there was a, there was a good one. I think it was you and Glenno because we had Glenno down. Um, uh, he was episode four. We've uh, we've only just uploaded it because everything that, that he's been sort of going through, we waited for every like the yes. and all the boys to be yeah, okay. Of so, um, and yeah. out of respect for all them, but there, it was. He was talking about a few of the old trips and there was one talking about the tin can. You guys were comparing. It was cutting backwards and forwards <laughs> between the landing. Right. And, <laughs> and it was like he's got the white, the electric <clears throat> windows and you, yep. you're doing your version of it. Yeah, yeah. It was great. It's, it was it was such a cool truck. It's it's one of the reasons that I 
uh, the first one I had was a forty. Was kind of like a half forty five, half forty seven, but it was, it was a bitzer that from a couple of different trucks yeah. that we built, yeah. uh, which had an old uh, H motor in it, uh, which is actually getting around down here now. He's, he's the guy that's got it. Um, did a lot more work to it than than we did, uh, and now we've got the shorty, uh, which has got a two four two o. 302 in it. Oh, yeah. With a bloody Gilmer drive and all the whistles and, yeah, yeah. and craziness yeah. and, you know, drop the clutch and do a backflip kind of stuff. That one. Bit of fun. Yeah. You know. Um, but it's yeah, it's the early days uh, and, and, I, and I reference it quite a lot of, of what got me into the four-wheel drives was because I had a shop up the coast and at that time we were still buying stuff and mm. slamming them down and making them go quick and it was about 2014, I reckon, where up the coast where everything shifted from that to – off road for mm. our type of clients, um, and it was. And I know it says it on the back that you're not supposed to broadcast the DVDs, but we always had them in the showroom, just course. on, on course. play. And uh, our half hour dramas would be, you know, you'd be walking past and something would catch your eye, and you'd be standing there for half an hour not doing any bloody <laughs> work. But it was, um, it was, it was, and, the, and that video that you did where you, the the last run um, yeah, was yeah. was one of those. One of those videos where it kind of like, because I think it's a part of me is a bit of a, you know, dad was a dairy farmer, you know, yeah. old school, hard ass kind of mentality. But there's stuff like that that, that gets you and you're like, that was just, that was a hard one to watch. Mm, yeah, it was a, it was actually a really hard one for me because, you know, I started out with the same attitude I have to most things, you know. Um, it was a machine. Yeah. And I'm, I'm a machine bloke like you, you know. Yeah. In fact, the only difference is if you'd looked underneath Milo, you would have gone, gee, that's a mess. You, know, you, <laughs> you really should have tidied those welds up on the inside too, <laughs> you know. Um, but for me, a machine is – you can imbue it with character if you use it enough. If you're in it enough, yeah. it becomes part of you. Yeah. And uh, that's a good feeling. I didn't realise how much Milo was a part of me, but my DNA was in that truck. Like, yeah. literally, you know, I'd, yeah. I'd bled in it. Or <laughs> I'd, yeah. I'd shaved my beard. I'd done a lot of things in that truck and, uh, <laughs> over a lot of years. and um, But she was worn out. And the problem was I could have got big money to stick it on a pole at a four-wheel drive business. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I won't mention who, but a rather large one in Victoria wanted it on a pole. Yep. And it was going to be, you know, decent dough. And then, the, as I say, the museum rang up and said, look, we're looking for iconic vehicles for our four-wheel drive collection. We're going to go that way. We're going to do this, that and the other. Um, the, the difference is, and if this ever happens to you, which I reckon it will given the stuff you build, if someone wants something of yours in a museum, you need to find out what the museum is because this is the only government-run one. Right. Everybody else is a private museum. So you put your vehicle in it. And your kids forget about it and it just became theirs. And if they sell it, you know, yeah. for, sell the museum with the collection and ownership isn't clear, you're in strife. So in my case, I didn't really want to sell Milo. I didn't want to see it on a pole. Or yeah. I didn't want to rebuild it. I was running out of options. I was actually going to chuck it in a shed on the farm yeah. and just, you know, keep it there just so I could go and sit in it occasionally, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. And and uh, and then this came along. So, bang, into the museum. She's there forever. She's, you know, Mal Leyland's Land Rover's there. And really? There's some pretty famous old stuff there. The first F FX, 48215, Holden. Wow. All the records for the early motor industry, because Adelaide was really big on building cars. Well, yeah. You know, and um, uh, so... Yeah, that's, that's where it's at. It was good. That, that was going to be my question was it was like, you know, if, if they ever decide they're going to change it up or, or or whatever is like, do you get a call? Do you like, is it, like is it, does it come home or is it theirs <coughs> to do what they want or? No, it's theirs to do what they want. But yeah. part of that deal is that they can't sell it. Yeah. And they can't, you know, they, they could possibly um, recommission it, chuck it in the birds, uh, what do they call it? The birds, Birdwood to the Bay run. The museum yeah. runs this thing called the Birdwood to Bay, you know, and they get the Assotto Franchini and the 
first Rolls Royce to go north, south and all that kind of stuff. And Yeah, but as and, long as it's you driving but it. But that's – well, that's that was part of the deal. They said, listen, yeah. if we're ever going to do that, we'll get you in. You yeah. Know? Anybody else driving that would just be wrong. Well, it's not just that. It's probably a safety issue, man. <laughs> <laughs> I could teach someone like you to drive it, mate, but oh. there was very few who ever did. Glenn Haddon did. He, he, uh, yeah. he drove Milo a few times. Yeah. He used to get out and get back into his Land Rover or whatever it was as quick as he could, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> she had holes drilled in the floor, had yep. no floor mats. Yep. So the, um, that was so water would drain out. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. You know, and yeah. dust and you can't keep dust out of something like that. No. Um, yeah, she was she was rough as guts, but I'll tell you what, you know, I sat in it that many times for hours and hours and hours and just enjoyed it because it just yeah. used to motor along. It was a lovely old thing. Yeah, it was, it was good watching that. The first... Um uh, the first episode we, uh, we spoke about that uh, with Glenn was the first episode that you did for uh, Low Range when you did uh, Fraser Island and then you did the telly track where he popped oh, the tire right. and yeah, up yeah. to Kinkuna and all that, yeah. which is where I found out about Kinkuna and have that's probably I've got I brought it up on this that many times. It's my <laughs> favourite place okay. to go away camping yeah. is Kinkuna Beach, and it was because of that episode. Yeah, right. Uh, Excellent. Finding it was tricky because uh, mm. uh, I had. I can't remember what we were running at the time. I think we were running the VMS things from uh, oh, yeah. from Super Center. Yeah. And I was like, God, that was about as reliable as a warm <laughs> fire after a curry. Yeah, it sort of give you, you know. an arrow in the middle of a grey yeah. nothingness with a bit of green or something. Yeah, and then it was oh, like, yeah. then you went, go, I went over to the Hemas and it was like you needed a bloody, some sort of college education to work. To work thing. it, yeah. I just ended up getting to a point where I'd use my phone and get maps and zoom out and work out which way I was facing and just try and make a track in that direction. Yeah. And that got me out of trouble more, more than enough. We used to, um, over the years, you know, the, the HEMA's got a bit too complicated for me. Yeah. And I'm, I'm still using an old one. Yeah. But I run that and I run my phone and if I'm looking for a track somewhere, I'll be running Google Maps. Yeah. Because that's still your best bet to pick pick up what's left of something yeah. off in the bush, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which was a lot of fun, but you can never rely on just one thing. No. I used to have a ship's compass in Milo underneath the dash. Oh, really? Yeah. Just, That's just, cool. just to – I always need to know what direction I'm going in. Most of the time you know where the sun is and, you know, it's not yeah. hard, but yeah. it's just good to know, you know. Yeah, right. You haven't set off. Um, classic example, there's a guy called Steve I used to work with us. Yep. He, he towed trailers for um, various companies over the years. And um, Steve was a big, wild man, you know. He's a good bloke. Right. Um, he's dead now. But I remember once he just got a new girlfriend, you know, and he's, she's sending him photos of, of some sort of nature <laughs> and he's right up the, the tip of the cape and he's finally got a bit of range and he's, oh, oh, oh. And that was the day we finished. So he said, right, that's it, I'm out of here. And he had a Hilux and a camper trailer and he just left at about 100 miles an hour. And I putted off in Milo, you know, just moseying along. Yeah. And um, I think it was about two days later, I'm down down at Archer Roadhouse and in pulls Steve and he's, he's gone completely the wrong way and then he's gone completely <laughs> the wrong way again and then he's gone completely the wrong way. So uh, I don't know where his GPS is. It might have been in his pants, but it uh, wasn't working real well. <laughs> he's following something, though. He's following something, though. Oh, jeez. No, you've got you to have a rough idea where you are. It helps. Oh, the, the the old school mechanical compass. That's that's because I've well, I've got the one on the phone, but it's again that's only subject to yeah. whatever it is the internet reception or, or satellites or whatever. But the old school mechanical one's a good idea. You can get a good boat bubble one for twenty or thirty bucks. It's not a big deal. Yeah. Or um, we used to survey our own mining sites, my brother and I, when we had to put in claim notices years ago. Yeah. So in those days we had an army compass. You know, because then you can get it within the degree, and that's useful. That's always useful. They're quite yeah. good. But anyway, that's a whole new world. You don't need to know where you're going, mate. Well, I don't get away <laughs> enough to worry about it these oh, days. Oh, that's no good. No, we were talking about it last time. It's, um, I, I mean, Cancun, is, it's been probably two years, been be the middle of 22 since the last time I got away. It's just... Wow. It's just there's too much going on. I've looked at I've looked at doing expansions on this. Like we're currently filming obviously we got this as, as our series. Uh, but the build series that we're filming as well, um, that's uh, going on channel seven. Uh, that I think that, that 
uh, is like about February that they've signed oh. us up for eight episodes for that. So it's stuff like the 80, that's one of the episodes. Oh, that'll be great. Um, and it's just, it's kind of, I, I, I throw it back to like, it's like American Chopper but with four drives. Yeah. So, you know, there's there's a lot of, and there's a lot of touring shows and there's a lot of and there's a lot of um, lifestyle shows, but I just I wanted to bring it back to just like built fabrication and in the shop and you know the, the, the beginning is either us buying a truck or yeah. talking to a customer for a build and you know, seeing it through till the end and all that. But choose um, your time. Choose your time. As soon as you film yeah. something, you're chewing up time. Twice, it, three times faster than everyone else. Well, yeah, we did you that know, with the, the, the 80 series bonnet they did for Sammy Young. Look, I'm normally a couple of days on them. I reckon I was mucking around with that for four days. Yeah. Just <laughs> camera, working out camera angles. Work and what, camera you know, angles, yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. but um, You just get going, you've got to go and push something, you know. Yeah, and then there's yeah. that. And then there's the, you know, I, I still do everything. I'm still, like, I deal with the customers and I do the job and then now we film and it's networking and, you know, putting together, you know, that's that's the partners that we've got for, for this first season. And, you know, I mean, there's a lot of guys in there that I know personally, but, yeah. you know, networking yeah. deals with, you know, people that are like bigger companies that you can't get to the owner, you know, that's always a lot harder too. And I'm not anybody that comes to me specifically. So it's like, there's only so many hours in a day. Oh, no, mate. But I do, I do, I do want to get away. I keep saying it. And I will do it at some point. Hey. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <clears throat> I'm, a, I'm a little bit different. I I chose all my jobs dependent on how much travelling was involved. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Like, and it keeps you poor <laughs> for a long time, you yeah. know, unless you crack it. Yeah. But um, everything, you know, I was a prospector, a motorbike tour guide, you know, bush cook. I was a mm. shearer's cook for a while, you know. Oh, gee, that wasn't easy. Yeah um, right. Yeah yeah, that was fun. Um, how did you how did you transition from like with I mean back I mean now these <laughs> days everybody knows everybody because of the internet but back then it would have been a lot of networking. Oh, well, <clears throat> when you're in the bush, it's that's yeah that's pre-internet networking. Yeah, you know you know everyone. So uh, in our case, uh, my brother and I were the local bikies and mining in Lightning Ridge. You know, yeah. and uh, we had a few mates and whatnot. And that was in the 1980s, early 1980s. They had this thing called the Wide Comb Shearers Dispute. Have you ever heard of that? No. No, it's before you were born, isn't it, probably? Uh, what are we, 81? 81. 81, There yeah. you go. right? So it was actually you were two or three, I'd reckon. Okay. Um, and what happened was New South Wales shearers, um, union shearers all over Australia sheared with a narrow comb. Right. Okay, you know. And the Kiwi shearers sheared with a wide comb. And the Kiwis... Uh, would come out here and so basically they didn't want these gangs of Kiwi kids coming in shearing more sheep for less um, and not in the union, essentially. Right. right. So it became, it was quite a big thing in the bush. Yeah. And um, anyway, we had a couple of, uh, I used to fix machines for the cockies harvesters and do a lot of harvesting, stuff like that in season. Yeah. And, um, and we had, you know, one day we just had this Kiwi bloke at the bar came up and he said, mate, I've got to get out of town. I've got the union boys chasing me. I've got two teams. And they were all kids, 19, 20, 21, you know. The, the rouseabouts were girls and the, yeah. the cook was a girl with one of the teams and all the rest of it. And, and he said, um, you know, the union boys are going to carve us up. And they were sending up wharfies. You know, it was typical New South yeah, Wales. My, gra- my grandpa was a wharfie. Yeah, yeah. I can tell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hard blokes. Oh, and, yeah. yeah, hard blokes, you know, and but it was union. So by the time they got to the bush, you could nearly always talk them down with a few beers, you yeah. know, like you're, you're out of your league here, mate. You're, yeah. you're a long way from the city. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of holes around here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's yeah, have a beer, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know. Anyway, we wound up with a couple of um, shearing teams. That's how it happened. And yeah. then the cook left. And, I mean, having a shearing team is just a question of getting them work yeah. and feeding them, basically. Right. And... and so I learnt to cook real quick in, in, in slow combustion stoves and shit like that, you know. So. Yeah, right. That's cool. It was fun. But it wasn't enough fun to do it for more than two years. Right. And I wasn't travelling. It nailed me. So when we were prospecting, we used to go and do the gold in Victorian high country yeah, right. in winter. And uh, we'd, we'd duck over and do a bit of Andamook, a bit of Opal over in South Australia. Um, 
We never made much money out of mining, to be honest. Just out of Victoria, high country, and winter would have been... That. Oh, sorry, in summer, in our... Oh, summer, right, yeah, yeah right, okay. Uh, I was like, geez, that's yeah. a shit time to be up there, <laughs> bloody digging. <laughs> well, some operations in mining are dependent on when the National Parks guys might be around, but we won't go there, all right? <laughs> right, um, right. The, the, the bottom line, I guess, was uh, I never figured I'd live past 30, so... As a motorcycle rider, I knew what I was capable of. Yep. And um, and so I just pegged every job, every occupation I wanted to have. I was very selfish yeah. because I didn't have a wife, I didn't have kids, I didn't have to worry about money. Well, that, then that's you not know. selfish. It's just you're just living your truth at that time because that's you, all you had to worry about was you. Pretty much. Yeah. And that's oh, pretty yeah. much all I did do too. Nothing <laughs> <laughs> wrong with that. But then once I got nailed, mate, that was it. I mean, you know, yeah, changed the world a bit. It's um and, and getting into so you, you like the full the uh, no the motorcycle like the tour guides and all that sort of stuff and you're going into you land freelancing with four drive monthly. Well, I was working on magazines before that. Right, but that was um, live to ride and. Well, and, uh, the, the first one was. Are we R rated or what? No. Uh, there, there is no rating. There's no rating? No, we're good. Okay, so you guys once again would have missed out on all of this because of the internet, but right. there used to be a magazine called Penthouse Forum. I did, no, we're not that old. We're okay. not that young. No, right? no, well, Penthouse, Penthouse had the girly pics in, Forum had the dirty stories. Ah, so, yeah, it was all one when we come through. Well, it was like yeah. they had been combined by then. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. And anyway, they used to pay a lot of money for letters, which were all made up by people. Yeah. And in one case, that's one of the people who was sitting out in a mining camp, you know, and whenever I got – I taught myself to type yeah. and I could make a couple of hundred bucks writing a bunch of letters for this magazine, you know. So, <laughs> so I'd, sort of, I'd, I'd sort of <laughs> sit here and I'd, I'd yell out, you know, you'd have your – there was always a few blokes hanging around. And, yeah. You know, hey, uh, you know, if you were living in a house full of um, Swedish backpackers – <laughs> you know, who uh, all were netball champions or something and, and there was only one share and it wasn't working very well, what would you do? And, you know, they'd fire me their answers that quick and I'd write them all down and send it off and get another 50 <laughs> bucks. <you know? laughs> so, oh so, my God. so that's how it started. And then there was – this is quite embarrassing. I haven't revealed most of this. Uh, You're <laughs> embarrassed. I'm thinking, like, we're, well, whatever we were reading at the time, this guy in the book. Yeah, well, that's the with problem. With a bunch of blokes. <laughs> oh, listen, if you, ever won the, if you ever read anything that started out, you know, unfortunately I was born an infomaniac. It's probably <laughs> me who wrote it, you know, some hairy bloke in a mining camp. Trust me, it's not. Oh, that's it's, fucking brilliant. Yeah, well, it was a bugger, <laughs> I can tell you. But, um... Uh, then for a while I was the Star Lady, Athena the Star Lady. It wasn't Athena then, it was um, Xena. Oh, and what, I, like horoscope yeah, stuff? Yeah, horoscope stuff for a yeah, ladies' cool. magazine. And until I had a, a girlfriend at the time, I dressed her up, took photos of her. Yeah. They all thought she was doing it, you know. Um, and I was writing it and I, I, oh. bought, I bought a box full of 1920s Smith's magazines, which is a really early Aussie magazine, right. had horoscopes in it. Yeah. And I thought, what can I do with this? I just rewrote it in modern form, and um, you know, and I knew I, I I knew some of the people in the publishing company. Yeah. So you'd sort of get a bit of goss and you'd chuck it in as a rumor, and yeah, yeah. No, I love playing with words. You know, that that was good fun, That's and great. and it paid, and it paid our fuel bills and all sorts of stuff, and yeah. And then because of that, and because I rode motorbikes, I used to race bikes, not very well. I was. Pretty crap at that actually, but um, because I rode bikes, uh, one of the guys at Two Wheels who I knew, you know, nepotism always works. Uh, he said, "Listen, there's a place here for three months." This was 1986 or seven. He said, um, "We got a guy's leaving, and we got no one to sit in his seat." And I'd already done a few yarns for him, so I said, oh, "I'll come down three months," you know, yeah, in right. the city, in my thirties, single wow. it was great. Um, cool. Got paid not much, rode motorbikes for a living. I thought, this is fantastic. So I did that. I wound up staying. And um, and because of that and because of the magazine background, it was really easy to get in with four-wheel drives and caravans and stuff like that. Yeah, so when that kicked off, you were sort of already on the ground running. I was there. Yeah. Really, I was lucky. You get lucky in life. You've got to take advantage of it. It's like a train going past 
you've got two seconds to decide whether or not you want to be in Mount Isa. You know, so, yeah. you, so yeah. you hop on. Yeah. <laughs> you know. And, and at that time, you're still, you're still, still single and it's like, just fuck it, go for the adventure. Didn't matter. Yeah. Just go flat out, you know. And I was living in a veranda of a mate's place down in Coogee for the first, well, for the first four or five months. And um, he, was a, he was a very busy guy. He was a young bloke trying to make a, a fortune and yeah. so was his flatmate. So they were out 18 hours a day working, you know. Yeah. And I'd sort of do the domestics. That was my share of it, you know. And yeah. Yeah, it was good. I like living in Coogee. It was nice. I could go for a swim in the mornings. Hate cities. <laughs> yeah. But if you've got yeah. a beach in front of you, you're okay, you know. So. Yeah, I'm definitely I love the I love the beach. Where 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 we are at the moment, we've got a view of the Brizzy River, so it's like it's still water. That's the same, you've got to have water. Yeah. If um, you can. It's yeah, that's we're we're just we're at the process at the moment of, of looking to, to move and, and work out sort of what we want to do, but it's yeah. It, you married? Engaged. Engaged. Yeah. 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 We are. Uh, both of us are sort of second time round. We've both got kids and okay. um, both sort of a little bit more settled down now. And yeah. I mean, I'm still an idiot, but, you know, and <laughs> that's, I mean, it's one of those things. It's Don't like, stop being an idiot, Ben. That's what you, that's, you never get anywhere in life unless you can do that. Well. Admit to it and then go flat out, you know. Yeah, I tend to just be a flat out idiot. It just keeps <laughs> me entertained, you know, get some stories out of it. Sean's known you all your life and he's sort of wagging his hand there going, yeah, that's right. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, we're a bit. We're we're like the original odd couple. <laughs> he's like he's like the the educated, you know, uh, smart, persistent, yeah. stable, and I'm the lunatic. Yeah. So, yeah. top up, you good? Oh yeah, please. Yeah. Um, There's no gin in it, by the way. If you're listening. No. Well, Oops, no. Thank there's you. Not. Sorry. There's not. That but suits I, me. And I know that's all good. I know. I know. I know you got other stuff to do, so we're gonna. We're just going to pee. Uh, we're going to pee. We're gonna, <laughs> when you keep drinking water, I'll be peeing like a racehorse. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Uh, we're going to behave. Behave. So um, action. So it's a fall drive monthly. So, but it was super, did Super Center exist then? No. Was, no, look. Um, it's a uh, – how can I shorten the story? All right. There's a guy called Charles Vella. A Maltese migrant, right? right? Came out here when he was seven, had a bunch of brothers, you know, uh, no money. Used to pick up bottles around the western suburbs of Sydney. Right. Anyway, he got into accountancy, got into publishing companies, uh, worked his backside off, wound up running a company, owning a company called Express Publishing. And um, Express had 47 magazines. Magazines were really good money, you know, that's why... Um, uh, Packers and, yeah. you know, ev everyone sort of, what's his name, Murdoch, you know, the, yeah. these are the kind of guys. Um, no one really knew about Charles Vella, you know. He sort of yeah. came from behind. He was just very good at what he did. And he had a string of magazines. He had things like scrapbooking and um, all sorts of stuff. Anyway, he came along and he said he had an artist who drove a troop carrier that was jacked up a bit and had big wheels. And yeah. Charles was a bit of a vehicle nut too. He had, he had hot fours and rotaries and all that stuff that you were talking about earlier. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So you were probably reading his magazines, not even knowing he owned them. But um, he saw this Toyota and he said, you know, maybe we should do a magazine about lifestyle four-wheel drives instead of... Because every other four-wheel drive magazine was take the new Defender, test it all the way to the Hunter Valley... Stay in a lovely place, drive it back, and report on how good the seating was. You know, they right. were they were all pretty much like that. And um, uh, even the only exception was probably uh, Bush Driver to some small degree. Yeah. And um, everybody else was after advertising, and the big advertising was the new car sales. So you know they'd do a road test. Well, we started out doing road tests too, but then we'd mix it in with. Um, you know, here's George's GU Patrol with the with the big block in it. You know, and yeah. and, and we quickly realised that that's the stuff people were interested in, which is why um, why Milo basically. You know, yeah. I thought I'm not going to. I could just go and buy another 75 series in those days, or no, you know, I'll do this my way. And um, anyway, so Charles Vella owned all of that, uh, and unlike a whole lot of people in the magazine business. First of all, he went, well, hang on, DVDs are working. So put a free DVD on the front cover of the magazine. Yeah. Wow. 
They cost a fortune to make those DVDs. Back when it first came out, I can imagine. Oh, you know. But he just took the risk. Yep. And he went... And, and we were actually second highest men's magazine in 2013, 14 in sales. Really? After Penthouse. Wow. We were so <laughs> fair, 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 you know. That's not a men's magazine no. anyway. It's full of girls. But <laughs> there was 75,000 75, we were selling by then, which was huge, you know. And, yeah. and those DVDs carried more advertising and more wealth than – well, not more than the magazine, but there was a lot of dough coming in and he was supporting a heap of magazines with the dough from this one. He started Caravan and Motorhome. He started... Um, well, I helped him with all of these. Uh, Camper Trailer. There was, there was heaps of spin-offs. But, so he was a really smart fella, a very good accountant, um, didn't suffer fools. And I don't know how he put up with me. He told me once, well, you fight the battles out in the bush and I'll fight the battles here in the boardroom. And I went, okay, mate, that suits me, you know. Yeah, that and sounds fair. Yeah, it was very fair. As long as I don't have to come down here very often, I'm in. Yeah. And then he started um, – subscriptions are a big part of magazines. Yes. Sub subscriptions mean someone's paying you up front for yeah. something they haven't got. Yeah. So it's your money. It's great. Yeah. And so he, uh, he started giving stuff away, high lift jacks and, you know, some of it was – not very good, yeah. but it didn't really matter um, because people thought they were getting it for nothing, Yeah, which they were ostensibly. Yeah, you the, know. the individual. Yeah, the yeah. individual pays 10 bucks for a magazine, gets the magazine, gets a free DVD, yeah. and if they subscribe for a year, they get a, a tool roll, yep. you know. Yep. Might be made out of cheese, but it was a tool <laughs> roll, you know. <laughs> yep. And then this meant, because he was getting printed in China, so he had access to China, uh, he knew what was going on, you know. He's a very switched on bloke. He had big storerooms that he owned in Sydney. He owned everything. He owned the works. It wasn't renting, you know. It was all owning for yep. him. And um, and then we had this guy come along. I can't even remember his name. Tigers. Do you remember Tigers Eleven? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yep, yep. So you'd see this ad in the magazine, big yellow ad with red type or something like that, and it just had ridiculous prices for stuff. You know, like a high lift jack that TJM would be 150 bucks was 25 bucks or something. Yeah. And the guy's just bringing in container loads of stuff from China and flogging it off. Well, Charlie's, Charles has seen this. Yeah. And he's gone, well, that's smart. Yeah. So he bought him out. Right. And then, because he could see magazines were starting to die, you know, YouTube and yep. the internet and everything else just took over. He could see all that. And, um, so he said, right, well, I'm going to go into, uh, what does he call it, um, Super Centre. Yeah, it was actually, yeah. was actually at one stage going to be Ruthie's Outdoor Shop, but um, there was a whole lot of reasons why I wasn't happy with that. But, uh, anyway. Well, especially like product quality back that, then too. And that was the biggest one. You just nailed it. So he opened up the Super Centre and from what I understand, you know, he's got a whole team of people working on it. Um, he buys every shop. It's not like BCF or something where it's a public-owned company. Yeah. He owns the whole lot. So if he starts a shop, he's bought the premises, yeah. you know, and, man, he's good. He's just a great businessman, you know. He's probably one of the wealthiest people in Australia you don't know about. Well, um, then that's the thing. It's like it's a it's come a long way. There's a lot of stuff now that, that you would buy. Exactly. You know? Yeah, there, and there people do. There was definitely stuff in the beginning that was like, I could I back then I could because what were you you left you left action about what 15, 15 14, yeah, 14, 14 yeah. 15 um, because of the products that's what the I was cheap literally products. was about to say was like I would be the thing for me would be like you know your because it was it's it's wasn't as salesy obviously back then as as it's no. become but it, it would still be I'm like you know I'm trusted in this industry and you're getting you getting me to sell your shit i'd be like well oh, i mean i would be personally going like i'm not putting my name to that because it's it's me they're going to curse when they're out if it breaks or whatever you know and and basically that's about it. it 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 was also um um it was an unknown it was a great unknown and uh, the bottom line, and this is why it wasn't Ruthie's four-wheel drive store, and it, I mean, it was a stupid name anyway, it wouldn't have worked, but um, part of the 
the deal was that John was going to travel around the country visiting stores. You know, we don't need you to do trips anymore. We'll get Sean and Graham to do those. And it was like, hang on a minute, that's the bit I like. Yeah, that's the reason <laughs> you're I'm doing gonna, it. That's the reason I'm doing it, you know. Yeah. You take that out and hang on, I'm a glorified shopkeeper. I'm, you know, no offence, shopkeeping is great, I'm sure, but um, I just couldn't do it. I, uh, to even shows, you know, I used to love meeting people. Yeah. But you spend three or four days at a show yeah. and you – pardon me – your smile is sort of propped up with toothpicks. Yeah, yeah. You know, you'd get home, I'd spend two days in a cupboard pretty much. I wouldn't want to talk to the kids or anything. Yeah. And, um, uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a private person. I like a lot of people. A lot of time on my own. And I used to get that travelling in Milo. Well, yeah. Glen, yeah. Glenno and the other guys would all take off. They had heaps more speed. <laughs> I, I'd get there in time. Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> Do you think that was a, a part of it too? Was being able to be kind of like when you when you're away traveling. I mean, obviously, it's still like the concept is to be able to you know make money and advertising and pay bills and whatever. But going out on your own is not so rigid in the schedule. And because I remember that was part of the thing that I, I noticed was the the cameraing was. And I said this to Glenn too. There's one in that first episode where you're on a sand dune. And you've got the the drone rising up behind mm. you, and it was so much more cinematic, and it looked like you guys were having more fun. Yeah. In that when when you went out on your own for low we, range, we had a lot of fun. You know. <clears throat> yeah. Um, we also had a really good production crew, like, you know, Glenno was one of the main backers behind all of that. Right. And he he likes he he knew enough because he'd done enough trips. Yeah. By that stage. He knew that production made the big difference, you know. Yeah. And um, you, I think you've you've actually found a reason I never really thought about. But I don't like people telling me what to do, and I don't like schedules. And as long as I had the, I could deal with the bush, and he dealt with the boardroom, it was fine. Yeah. But when it was John, we need you in the boardroom on a regular basis. And travel and, and, and oh, yeah. you might have to move to Sydney. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what <laughs> you yeah. know? Like, no offence, you know, people who live in Sydney, that's wonderful, but. Not for me. No. And my family wouldn't have moved. And I just I just thought, okay, well, in actual fact, I was just going to go back to machines. Um, really? Yeah, I was just going to. My fallback job has always been bobcats and trucks. Yeah. And I can do that all day long. I love it. Yeah, see, know? Ruthie's bobcats and trucks has a good record. <laughs> that. That'd be all right. That'd, that would have worked. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it was obviously, obviously, it was a good, a good move, and 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 it got uh, a lot of every every. I mean, like it's it's you guys, and I said the same thing to Glenn. Like it's you are the originals, mm. you know. It's what it's when it was more pure, like because the earlier stuff. Because I was, I had, a, I had a whopping great gap. I I remember TV shows like The Bush Tucker Man. Yes, and then I remember you guys with action. And it's and there was nothing in there that got my attention for whatever reason, but it was that it was that that gap and then yeah. and you guys coming back through and then when you left, uh, I think it was it was the Unlock Australia that you wanted to do and and all that. It was I remember being like, it's really hard, and, and I and I, I say this with all due respect, but it's and I've been proven wrong in, in some part, but it was like when you guys left and went and did your own thing and Sean and Graham took over i felt like it was like that that top gear it's like you can't remake that it's yeah. that's not the same you know, it's not the same with different guys it's you know but they've they've taken it and run with it and all that but yeah. then when you guys did your own thing it was like yeah okay well so it's you now kind of like at the best of both worlds um that was fun but there's there's a time for everything yeah. you know and as a kid i saw uh well, in fact i met the leyland brothers uh, when we were in the flinders ranges and i was only I don't know, 12 or something, yeah. um, on one of their very early trips and, and I used to watch them on TV, yeah. you know, and I'd go, gee, they're all right and their wives are pretty good and this is pretty cool. <laughs> but it wasn't about cars. No. You know, they they were actually both good mechanics. I know them, well, I knew them. Yeah. Um, but they did their thing. They showed people Australia, you know, and it was awesome. Um, another generation, you yeah. know. Uh, it wasn't really lifestyle four-wheel driving. It was more, you know, let's go for a walk around Cradle Mountain and 
we got here in the combi or whatever. You know, yeah. sometimes it was Land Rovers, uh, and they were pretty good at dodging things too. You know, I, I'll never forget uh, Kainuna, the Blue Healer Hotel, um, staying there once, and um, they had different names for their rooms, and one was the Leyland Brothers' room, and I went, "Oh, fair income, did they stay here?" You know, yeah. oh yeah, yeah, not in that room, um, but yeah, they stayed here. In fact, uh, they filmed. I said. Do you know what the, my favourite little bit out of any Leyland movie ever was? They've done a diff in a short wheelbase landy, right? Right in the middle of nowhere. You know, as far as you can see, there's no trees, there's nothing. It's like a gibber desert <laughs> and bit of salt bush, and you know. And they've tipped this thing on its side, which is the beauty thing of a Land Rover. You know, it's got square sides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they tipped it on its side, pulled the diff out, fixed the whole thing on a picnic blanket, and put it all back together. <laughs> and I thought, wow, you know, I love that. I, w- I want to do that. That's Burke and Wills. That's the middle of nowhere. Anyway, so I'm telling the publican this and he said, yeah, he said, they did it 200 yards out the back of the pub here. <laughs> 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 Came in for a beer at the end of the day. I said, you're kidding. He said, no. Nah. That's you great. Know. But, I mean, they could have. It's, uh, not having a go. But um, it was a good lesson for me too because the other side of that is uh, you've got to quit when you're ahead. Yeah. You know? And the last time... I saw Mal Leyland, he's, he'd argued with his brother over that um, Ayers Rock garage thing north of Newcastle. They, they'd lost a lot of dough for a lot of reasons. Um, Mal was selling books, which are really good books too, by the way. He writes a really good book. But he was selling books at a show out of a little tent and, and I thought, well, I don't ever want to do that, you know. Like, yeah. I'll just – I'll finish being Ruthie four-wheel drive guy. Yeah. And then that's it, you know. And then you asked me to come and do a podcast. <laughs> no, it's good. Well, well I mean, you've, but you're still going. You've built that Mahindra. Yeah, well, that was... So that's come up all right. Look, people don't get this, right? Um, I've got some really strong ideas, I guess. One of them is Australia should be a free place to travel, okay? Yes, agree. I agree. This place is so big. And we have so many stupid rules. Yeah. You know, no dogs. You know, stuff like that. In England, they let you take a dog into the pub, you know, everywhere, on a bus, up the street, whatever. Yeah. And they got, like, nothing. You know, that's a country about the size of Brendale or something. I don't know. <laughs> and, and they got millions of people. Um, and here we are in Australia and we've got all these rules. Oh, you can't camp here. Or oh, you can't stop overnight. I lost the biggest deal of my life because I got up on a stage and said, right um, you know, we need to fight for free camping. Right. And it turned out that the, one of the strongest lobby groups in the country was the uh, Caravan Industry Association and they were lobbying for illeg- – it was illegal to camp anywhere outside a caravan park within a 200k zone of a caravan park. For anyone. So you could be fined for pulling up on the side of the road 198 k's out of Tennant Creek and camping, in theory, okay? Yeah. And I was just about to – that was after four-wheel drive action and everything else. I was going to sign a deal with um, uh, a, a crew called Parrot Productions who were doing Down Under Australia at that yeah. stage, which was a big thing on telly, you know. Yeah. And, um, and most of their sponsors were caravan manufacturers and industry parks and whatnot. Yeah. And they just went, no, we're not having anything to do with him. So that was that was a case where you stick your your personal oar in the water and you, you get it broken off, you know. Uh, and that happened a lot, of, a lot of times with that unlock stuff. I never got any support from the trade. That's why I got sick of it in the end. I thought, you blokes are all, you know, making money out of four-wheel drivers, but you won't support keeping the bush open, keeping the tracks open. Yeah. Not one of them. Yeah, individually they might talk about it, but oh no, they'll never go on record. They'll, nev- they'll never, never go, go on record, on record because yeah. of oh, you know, what happens if someone sues or there's a liability issue or, you know, what happens if the greenies don't like us? I'll tell you what happens if the greenies don't like you. You're doing something right. In my <laughs> mind, but yeah. That's beside the point. Yeah. But it was like, you know, there was that um, opening up Australia. I on, I really believe that every time a road intersects a river, there should be some free camping somewhere. And if it's owned by somebody, let him put a little thing in so we can drop five bucks in it. 
I really think there should be signs all over the country saying, welcome to Australia, we hope you love it. If you drop litter in Australia, you're going straight home. Yep. You know, it should be in the airport because I know that most of the litter in Australia, it used to be people like me, you know, and then generations we learned, hang on, you can't just burn your rubbish yeah. and expect it to, you can't burn it and bury it. You, you need to take it out. Yeah. We learnt that. Aussies learnt that. Aussies are really good at that. Yeah. Genuine bush lovers do that all day long. It's their church. But you get tourists and they go, wow, look at the size of this place. Yeah. Throw the wrappers out. Don't yeah. even think about it, you know. It's, there's a whole lot of things. And one of, the Mahindra thing is a case in point, right? When I was mining, I used to go backpacking whenever I had a few quid. I went to India lots of times. And... That was in the 70s and 80s, but I love India, right? Yeah. Also, I love the rest of the world too, for that matter, but Indians are more like us than anywhere. Right, okay. Uh, people don't get this, but they were a British colony for 200 years. They weren't even Indians. They were all these little tribes running around the place, and then right. Britain came along and nailed the whole place. Okay, that was about 1750. They had the East India Company. You might have heard of that. Yeah, I've heard of that one. So the whole place was run by the British, you know? They, uh, they did deals, they did whatever, whatever, but they bought the whole place together. And that's why the Indians now play cricket and they love their cricket much more than us. Right. You know, they are, they are maniacs on cricket, but they also tend to think the way we do because we've been a colony, English colony, for about the same amount of period. Yeah. The same amount of time. So it's a bit weird, but I see India... Personally, um, I know that 1.3 billion people, they just overtook China in the people race. Did they really? Yeah, they did. Wow. They've beaten China. And China's got an ageing population that's getting richer and India's still trying really hard. And one of the reasons we didn't get Mahindras here, they've been making Mahindras since 1950. One of the reasons we didn't get them here was because they could never make enough to satisfy the home market. But I don't know if you know this, and, like, this is great, isn't it? I get a chance to tell people my own thoughts. Absolutely. Ten years ago, I, I used to drive John Deere harvesters, tractors, stuff like that, fix them for people. They yeah. were the big name in the bush. That's what everyone had. Yeah. And they were the biggest tractor sellers in the world. And then all of a sudden, you don't hear that anymore. What we didn't hear was that Mahindra was the world's largest tractor seller. They overtook them. And if you go out on the farms now... <clears throat> You'll see red Mahindras all over the place. Yeah. They overtook them. And, but they never boasted about it because Indians are really slack at boasting. They don't know how to do it properly, you know. They, <laughs> they ring a bunch of bells and, and, and pray to their gods and stuff like that. But yeah. they are really humble people as a rule. Yeah, right. Very clever engineers. If your phone goes wrong, you're probably going to talk to an Indian. Well, yeah, there's that. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. and, and I reckon they make fantastic immigrants because they come from a similar background. So... So when I decided I'm not doing any more four-wheel driving except taking the wife bush yep. and we do some pretty cruel four-wheel driving, just the two of us, because I like to see her running with a winch rope. I think that's good for her, you know. <laughs> I hope she doesn't hear this. So that's going to go down like a lead balloon. <laughs> <laughs> She's all right. She knows me. Uh, she must. She's stuck with me. So, so I looked around and if you look underneath a Mahindra pickup, it runs a chassis very much the same as the 75 series. Leaf springs, same dimensions, same rivet construction, yeah. um, independent front. Uh, everything's got that, you know. Yeah. And, and so I thought, okay, I looked at it and I knew the story on them, you know. I've seen heaps of them in India. They, they love them. They, that's, you know, that and Tata is all they use. And they have some pretty rough roads over there. Oh, yeah. It's pretty horrible, especially up in the mountains, Nepal and all yeah, that. Yeah, you see some of those oh, videos yeah. and there's about 600 <laughs> of them hanging off oh, one yeah. truck. Oh, so, yeah. yeah. People, people ring me up and say, hey, how much, uh, how much caravan can you tow with your Mahindra? And I say, I don't know. Uh, I think they have started to rate them at a couple of tonne, but yeah. they never bothered in India. Why yeah. would you say, oh, it'll only take two and a half tonne when you're probably going to have to pull the school bus home? <laughs> You know, or, right. or like 4,000 ducks or, yeah. you know, you see them overseas. Oh, yeah, well, that there you go. That's a prime example. I don't mind doing something like that. Yeah. Because it's true. Yes. And Mahindra, uh, they couldn't believe it when I bought one of their vehicles. You know, they really? sort of, well, a couple of guys there, 
Aussie blokes. Yeah. Went, Hang on a minute, Ruthie's doing this, you know. They, they jumped on it and what are you doing? I thought, I'm going to build one up, see what happens. Oh, uh, it was a running joke that the, the Toyota would have had a bloody the stock price would have gone down when you first posted <laughs> that. Well, look, there's yeah, that's a whole new issue. But I just thought, righto, I hate seeing what Toyota's doing. Well, that new seventy nine, fuck, we've that had new, some fun with new that. New seventy nine. It's got. You, it's got. What is it? The, what are they called? The 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 capping that they put on the roof oh, to hold the guard up, like. Oh. So it's so bad. Oh, it's so bad. The three hundred, you know, yeah. like oh gee, but it's not that. It's the pricing. Yeah, it's extortionate. Good. Yeah, you can't. You know, Aussie farmers depended on the old Toyota, and it was the same price as everything else. Bit cheaper than a Jeep. Yeah, you know, eventually cheaper than a Land Rover. Solid vehicles, good things, and then someone in an accounting uniform took over at Toyota. And now you got people lining up to pay ninety grand, and up for something with no cup holders. Yeah, yeah. You know that needs work straight away. That's yep. and, and what have they done now? You know, putting a Hilux motor and a you know six speed. Yeah. Oil. I mean, the only good thing about a 79, 76 was the exhaust note, in my mind. Yeah, good uh, tough truck, but yeah. Look, the 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 early the early DP, uh, early DPFs, the 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 twenty sort of fourteen fifteen V eight seventy nines, yep, seventy sixes, love them. Me too. And I love the DPF seventy nine bonnet because it's bigger and I get to cut more of them up. And, you know, they're, <laughs> but they're like, I mean, I've, I've even got a pre DPF on the little BT fifty. Oh, you have too. Cut that up for shits and giggles, but. I didn't no. even notice when I was. I thought, gee, that looks aggro, but that's what it is. That's what it is. That's yeah. a nice job. Well done. Um, thank you. Um, but it's yeah, them love them. Yeah. But they're still, even secondhand now, with one that hasn't got all the fruit on it, you're still going to pay 50, 60, 80, 70 grand, whatever it is now. Yeah. Um, that's why I cut up the 80s and that, because it's like you can pick up one of that. I think that was 15, 10, 15 grand. You know, by the time they're done, they owe you 40, 50. Yeah. And that's done. It's a U, four corner coil, yeah. all the fruit, all, bull bar, winch, everything ready to go. And it's like, what am I going to buy for that? Uh, no. Whatever it is, I'm going to have you're to spend not. money on it. Well, I know in my case, right, I didn't want to build another truck. I just yeah. wanted to buy something, just once. A lot of that was because I'm retiring out of four-wheel drives. That was my thought. Yeah. I wasn't going to do any more. And then Mahindra, you know, sort of jumped on me a little bit. And, and I don't mind getting paid to go places, to be honest. I've always been a uh, – if someone else is paying your fuel bill, I'm in. Yeah, you know? yeah, fair call. Yep. You're a cheap date then. I'm a cheap date, I can tell you, you know, although the beer can get a bit expensive. But, oh, yeah. yeah. But um, so they came, you know, I thought, okay, well, I'll come back in a little bit. Um, and I've enjoyed it. I mean, but the thing is you go to places like – you find a good Mahindra dealer somewhere and there's not that many of them. They're growing. Yeah. In the last – they've gone from 11 dealers when I got mine nearly three years ago to – 52 or 3 or something, okay? That's, that's a lot of growth in three that's years. That's a lot of growth. But the old dealers, uh, a lot of them were, you know, selling Mahindras out the back of a lawn mowing shop or something in, in a country <laughs> yeah. area. Yeah. So you get a place like Dungog in New South Wales where there's hills and they've been real old school dairy farmers yeah. been piloting Land Rovers forever. And they can't afford a new Toyota, you know, no way. Um, oh, that's yours before you did the paint job. <laughs> yeah, it is. Well, is it? It's a wrap or a paint job? No, it's a paint job. It is a yeah, paint job. Yeah, all doors off, rubbers, yeah. the works. Yeah. Um, Land Rover Green. Yeah. <laughs> Couldn't resist. Yeah. But the whole point is, you, you get a dung gog, you'll see Mahindras everywhere. If you've got a good dealer who can fix them, supply them with parts, bang. Yeah. Um, Roma, lately, Toowoomba, places like this. You know, yeah, right. I've been places where. Uh, you used to see nothing but Toyota traybacks outside the stock and station agents. Yep. And now you'll see a line of Mahindras because they go they go down to the city and they buy three for the price of a Toyota. Yeah, that's, you know? that's crazy. And everybody knows how much Toyota spends on advertising. Yep. And Australians aren't stupid. No, the last few years everybody's been cottoning onto that a lot, and we, we've had a run and joke here for with with this for a, a while. We're not. We're not. It's, I've normally got a beer at my hand, but we're not. We're not. We're not sitting there going like we recommend Great Northern beer. Yeah, you know, yeah, we're yeah, just. Yeah. It's like it's in the back. Whatever we're doing Tastes is. Tastes right, doesn't it? Yeah. It's a good beer. It's a good beer. But um, yeah, it's you can. 
I think the last the last half decade or so, it's been, and it's been on my mind as well as a consumer because I still love all the shows. Yeah. But you get to a point where you're like, oh fuck, all right, here's the sales pitch. Yeah. You know, it's like, and 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 the the dealership, well, maybe not the dealership level, but the manufacturing level, like Toyota and all them, they're they're, they're pushing stuff so hard and it's like that money's coming from somewhere and it's just driving the price up. So it's, you know, the Mahindra's... Well, I can tell you, they actually, it's been worked out by a motoring journey mate of mine, how much each Toyota sale, it's a set figure, right? He's, that's how he worked it out for the whole lot. Yeah. Um, and it's embarrassing, you know. It's how much of it goes to the marketing side? How or? much goes straight into marketing out of every Toyota sold? Yeah. And... Um, when you start, I'm not going to say it because no, no. there could be legal ramifications. Fair call. But I trust the guy that did it, I know. And um, you only have to look around. How many signs have they got? You know what really pissed me off with Toyota? Uh, I never got any help from them at all. Didn't really expect it, but I tried a few times, you know. And, yeah. and um, just knock on the door. Oh, no, we don't want to be associated with, you know, Bogans who do up old trucks. We, we really wow. only want new trucks. Not in those exact words, you know. Enough of the point got across, but though. the point was very much, well, you know, we're actually a very um, upmarket Sydney marketing firm, John, and, you know, look, you've parked your motorbike out front, it's probably leaking oil, is it? You know, it was very, very snooty, and I don't like snooty. The snooty is not Australian. No. And these pricks. Yeah. Fair call. So I stopped doing it. Milo's in a museum. Milo twos with terrain tamer yeah. on a sort of a you can have a back because they put half of it in yeah, anyway. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the deal is you can have a back and I get it whenever I want it. You know, so that's a yeah, good deal for me. Yeah. Um, I sold the mustard truck. I just I sold all the wrecks in the backyard. And what do they do? They put out an ad with a farmer driving up a hill, watching the dial click over to nine hundred and ninety nine thousand. Yeah. Have you ever seen that? I haven't seen that. In a 40 that. series? Oh, okay. Well, I saw I that. I don't watch much TV anymore. It's all no, Netflix and shit now. No, no, no. Yeah, well, I watch it because uh, if I want to get in the same bed as my wife, I'm probably going to watch a little bit of late night TV, aren't yeah. I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair call. Fair call. Yeah. Yeah, no, well, the, actually, the, the Toyota dealership up the road here has got an old 45-ish, 47-ish farm truck, like the oh, yeah. FJ40, FJ45. It's got the... The body, the the, I don't even know what you would call it. The the, where the chassis is, the tray has a, a piece of wood between the chassis and the tray, and the top of the wood's flat, and the bottom of the wood shapes shaped to the over chassis. the loop of the chassis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've, I've That's how they used the door. That's so cool. But yeah. it's like you know, I've said to the the guys up there a couple of times, like if you ever want to um, ever want to do anything with that thing, like fuck, I'm just send them right. down. Yeah. yeah. But then I had uh, the last episode. We had uh, Richard Paul from Mr. Land Cruiser on. Oh, good blokes! Yeah, Excellent blokes. they yeah. were. They were. They were telling us how you basically put them two together. Now you're going to find this because you're going to influence more and more people on your way through. Right. But the biggest thing you can do in life is help people who are going the same way as you. Yeah. Okay. Because sooner or later it comes back, it bites you on the backside, <laughs> and and they're there when you need them. Yep. Do you know what I mean? Yep. And in Paulie and Richard's case, when I built Milo too, you know, Richard couldn't have done more. He was fantastic. And if I need parts, even now, I haven't got a 40 anymore, but yep. probably going to get one. But that's beside the point. I'm sort of missing them a bit, but we won't go there. But anyway, I would, uh, you know, go, just can't see Paulie and yeah. he'd sort it out. You've got to help people because what do they say? It's like a ladder, you know? You might be climbing up the ladder but you're going to be treading on those people when you come back down. So yeah. you better make sure they make room for you, you know? No, I, look, I, I, I love it. it. I think the this whole industry, this whole thing for me has been like a really cool experience, like getting everything so fast-paced and, and all that. And the, the time that I get doing these, it's like it's just a, to sit down and everything else stops for yeah. half an hour, hour, whatever it is. And it's like to have those conversations and to network. And that's that was how it all kind of started when I met Barney at, yeah. at the one of the four drive shows in twenty eighteen. And we I was just 
because I'm still a fan of everything. Like, I still, yeah. like, you know, having you rock up today, I was like, oh, fuck, that's Ruthie. <laughs> you know, like, but it's like. Jeez, we, he's fat and old. <laughs> oh, no. no, it's it's good. I love it all. Uh, but we, when I met Barney, it was like, um, I, I stood in line, you know, got to talk to him, and, and, and we held up the line for 20 minutes talking shit. And it's just been one thing after another. And then, you know, and Glenno coming down and, you know, Ruben from DMW and, you know, mm. there's, been, there's been a whole host of it. And it's like every time I get these stories and we're sharing things, because the whole point of this was in the beginning was I said to Vani, I'm like, how many times have you told the same fucking story? Yeah. It's like, oh, dude, you, yeah. you, wouldn't, you wouldn't even know. And I'm like, long form, let people sort of engage and, and chat because you guys have got – so many years and so many experiences and so many like opinions that you may or may not have been able to have, you know, in that filming kind of environment. It's like we get it out here. That's why it was not. You can structured. chuck them out. Yeah. Tell you something about Glenno, right? Um, which I think says a lot for his character. It sort of tells you who he is. We'd been working together. We'd been on a few trips yeah. already, and my version of a trip was the trip started when I got there. Well, not that sounds big headed, but. You know, if the trip kicks off at Friday from um, Dargo Pub, yeah. I'm there Friday, you know. Yeah. I don't muck around on the way down. I don't travel with anyone else, mostly because I'm travelling slower. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I go home. When the trip's over, I go home on my own. That's because I need a lot of time on my own, yeah. as well as the fact that I'm nursing an old truck. So um, so I've done, a, I don't know, maybe half a dozen trips with Glenn. know him really well because yeah. you're camping with people. Yeah. And, um, and a long... He, one day I'm at a four-wheel drive show, Brisbane, you know, a big one, yeah. and there's a queue of people out the door and the next person in line's Glenno. And I said, hey, mate, you know, you didn't have to line up. What the hell are you doing? Yeah. And he said, oh, just my boys wanted to meet you, so I didn't want to jump the queue. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, good on you, you know. Like, oh, I appreciated that, but it's just his character. Yeah. He was actually... He was making big money out of his businesses because he's a very good businessman. Uh, but he would come on trips and do the dishes. Yeah. Now, you know, because you go bush. Yeah. God, that sounds good, doesn't it? I think you just got a club going past yeah. this. Is all right. Yeah, that's Brenda. Yeah, so he'd come on a trip and you know, need a hand, Ruthie. Oh, mate, you know, if you could scrub that pot out or something. I would get people who came on trips. Um, and there was heaps of them over the years. And, oh, I'm big cog from AD bubble U bloody four-wheel drive, you know, and in Bendigo or I won't say that because the bloke from Bendigo is all right, but <laughs> somewhere, you know. <laughs> yeah. And, and I'm a, you know, I'm a big-time four-wheel driver and blah and blah and blah. And so I'll just sit here and bullshit and drink beer while you cook me a meal and then you can clean up afterwards. Wow. And I'd, I, would, I would have that a lot. You know, you do. Because, bear in mind, the, the sponsors are paying 10 grand or whatever to come on a trip, you know. Yeah. And usually they're going home with their truck on the back of a tray back after I've taken them a few places. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, yeah. You know, so it's costing them. Uh, but that's, that's your... That's but you're in the bush. Of, but that's part you're in the of bush. the thing. We didn't, have, we didn't have a... That's right. Not until low range. We, we oh, yeah, cheers. Yeah. Low range we had uh, a gopher. For the first time ever, he was an Aboriginal mate of mine, a guy called Chris Quinlan, yep. and um, uh, and it was great having him. You'd have Tough to the fun though is the, is cleaning up. Well, yeah, chicken, yeah. Trying to do the dishes when you're half cut. Oh, Chris, you know, I had to kick his swag to get him out of bed in time to go. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He was a good bloke, but yeah. If you want to go places in Australia, you have a local fella sitting next to you too, just quietly. You can go anywhere you want. Yeah, right. <laughs> Especially yeah. the last few years, you know? Yeah. Like, makes all the difference. But anyway, we can't yeah. go there. That's not right. Oh, there's a lot of, yeah, that's a whole other thing, isn't it? A whole other thing. But and it's not the locals, you know? It's not the real people. Yeah. It's national parks. They yeah. are the enemy. And only for a bunch of reasons, mostly to do with Canberra, I snuck in once to the ANU because that's where they do all the, National Park training at university, Australian National University, right? Yeah. So they've all got to have degrees now. That's the first thing. That is the most lefty institution in the entire world. Canberra is a lefty city anyway, but 
they get lectures in everything, you know, and but none of it's about national parks originally was pieces of land set aside for the enjoyment of the people. Yeah, just you, you just couldn't me, be, couldn't be privately owned. Couldn't be privately owned. Yeah. Horse riding, yeah. motorbikes, whatever. Now, I know they get a bit busy and they have to restrict them closer to the city and all the rest of it, you know. In the States, they found a lot of different ways to go around that, mostly by monetising it, you yeah. know, yeah, yeah. getting a private contractor. But I had, I think one of my seminal, seminal moments, I think that's the word, was in South Australia, where I'm from, yeah. where I ran into a bloke I used to know, went to school with him. On radio school, but you know we used to pedal the same speed. Yeah. And he um, he'd been in national parks because he was the th- he was the third son of the local cocky. Uh, couldn't go on the land, so he was a, a national parks groundsman. Right. He could drive tractors. He could chop wood. He kept the barbecues clean, the toilets clean. Knew more about that area because he was third generation South Australian yeah. than anyone, you know. He could tell people stuff. One day they came in and said, oh, you haven't got a degree, so we don't want you talking to any of the visitors anymore. Wow. And, in fact, if you need anyone to talk to them, here's your new boss. His name's Frank or whatever. And Frank's some city kid who's been trained. He's, he's and got the first... a piece of paper. He's got a degree. <laughs> he's got a piece of paper. And not only that, Frank's whole jurisdiction is to lessen the impact on the environment, as he's been taught in Canberra, which means keeping people out because people are bad. Did you know that? People are bad. Now, the next thing, you've got Victorian bush burning down all over the place. You've got crap going on because these idiots don't know how to manage the land. Give me the Simpson Desert. I'll go down to Belmont Rifle Club. I'll open the place up. I'll give everyone there, everyone who can hit a matchbox at 20 metres, I'll say, listen, November, that's your month, hottest stink, no one wants to go there. We're going to keep everyone else out. We're going to let you out there. We don't want, you can add camels to the list. I tend to think they're almost indigenous, but we don't want any cats. Right, fackle, yep. No cats. Now, as a regular Simo visitor for the last 50-odd years, I can tell you that in the old days... You'd go there early in the morning, you'd see little lizard tracks, you'd see the birds. You'd, it, the Simpson in the morning, desert, is so full of life, it's not funny. Yeah, for It used to be. Yeah. I think I picked up the last bilby in about 2014. Dead. Cat. Wow. The only animals you see there now are cats. The local Aboriginal fellas, same up the Gulf, they've been spreading rumours that cat tastes just like chicken in the hope... The, the brothers will get into it, you know? Yeah. But it's a far call for it. All they need to do is, but you see, lefty logic, greeny logic says guns are bad, you know? Yeah. Guns are really, really bad. Personally, I don't have a gun anymore. When I was in the bush all the time, I did. Yeah. You need a gun sometimes. Guns are a tool. Guns are a machine. Guns are a, a lovely thing from the machinery point of view. Guns are also a weapon. People kill people with them. You know, Sean knows all about that. Stick them to one side, maybe, yeah. if you're in civilization. But out in the bush, a gun is a management tool. Biggest problem up Cape York, pigs. Yeah, for sure. What are we doing about pigs? Oh, let's, um, oh, gee, hang on a minute. Oh, no, we don't actually have that. You know, we can't get rid of them. Dingoes, Fraser Island, they used to, oops, here I go again. Uh, <laughs> someone told me that they used to, bring in shooters from out in the bush, right. roo shooters, yeah. to do a cull every now and then. But then the greenies got so hard on not killing things that now we have a problem with dingoes chasing kids. Yeah. Okay? And you can you multiply this problem. I'll never forget down near Dargo once, driving through a little place down there. Um, I'll think of its name later. Always do. Anyway, ran into a mate of mine, ran the local garage there, right? And how are you going? name's Darby. I said, how are you going, Darby? And he said, oh, good, yeah. He said, I've got, got a new contract. I said, oh, far out. Who with? Oh, the government. I said, oh, bloody beauty. What are you doing? Oh, dog baiting. And oh. I, I said, mate, you know, like, have you ever seen an animal take a bait? I haven't, but I'm sure it's horrendous. It's horrendous. It's yeah. absolutely, it's, uh, it's, you, you might as well just eat broken glass, you know. Yeah. 
And not only that, it passes on. If something eats that and something, whatever, it's, 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 a, it's, it's horrible. It's just bloody horrible. And country people don't do it, yeah. you know. Parks does it because they got a dog problem. They, they don't like dogs because dogs aren't indigenous. Um, so let's try and sort it out a little bit. Baiting, I said, so how's this working for you? You know, like I'm getting a bit angry because yeah. he's a mate, but... He said, oh, John, he said, I know what you're thinking. Now, calm down. He said, it's nothing like that. He said, first of all, there's no one watching what we're doing. I said, okay, good. And he said, second, they give me vouchers to buy the poison, to buy the meat, to buy the diesel, and I've got keys for all the gates through the high country. I said, so what happens? He said, come around on Friday for the barbecue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) You know, and we'll get in the Forbes and we'll go shooting. Yeah. (laughs) You know, and... That was a long time, oh, maybe 10 years ago. Uh, it was just bush logic taken over from Parks. Yeah. Greeny stupidity. That's great. I love that. That's, f- yeah. It's a bit like out where I live in Wyndham. I know there should be fishing zones, but I don't think the fish know that. No. No. <laughs> It'd be good signs, if they did. It'd be signs good. underwater, you're uh, safe here. Mm. I don't know. They, anyway, that's another deal. Mm. Sorry, mate. No, it took us right off topic there, eh? That's that's the best part don't, about it. There's no, there's no, don't there's get no me on, <laughs> don't get me on my passions. <laughs> no, that, no, it's good, and that, you know what? That was one of the reasons that I, I I wanted to do this where where we were funding and it wasn't there was no target of you know X Y Z to because people were putting in money or whatever. It was like it's it. real conversations, you know, where, and wherever they went because it was like kind of like you, it, you know. Mm. I, I had somebody pass a comment about. Uh, the drinking the beers on it. I'm like, if people what? don't want to watch it, fucking, they're not my audience. If they don't like swearing, they're not my audience. They're, it's like we are, we're doing this for the enjoyment of it, um, mm. and it's like, you know, everything. Like, you know, you've got an event that you're doing, so we're drinking water. That's cool. We've got people that, you know, uh, Glenno had only a couple of beers because he was like, he just had his his stomach operation. Mm. It, it, up, down, left, right. It doesn't matter because no. it's like it's honest. Yeah. That's what a podcast can be, can be honest. Yeah, that's and, what I wanted. You know, you wait and see the government will stuff that up too someday. But, well, <laughs> you know, I used to listen to Joe Rogan. I used to really enjoy it. When it first came out, because he was just straight and honest. Yeah. And then he sold the whole deal to Spotify and got that rich. It wasn't funny and yeah. I haven't listened to him in years. But He's, uh, still, he's still really good. He's, he's what inspired this was, yeah. was the the... I mean, I've gone, I've gone back a few years and, and watched a lot of his stuff. But the, yeah. the, I, I like, I like the platform. I like the, you know, the the biggest thing with it was I wanted the shop to be able to set this all up, mm. you know, and get involved, you know, with some good guys to to have some topics to talk about. You know, I mean, like they're filming three or four a week. I'd be like, fuck, I'd never get any work done. <laughs> but um, that's all he's doing, though. Yeah. You know, but I, I wanted it to be like that. That was what inspired mm. this layout was because it was like, again, guys like you, guys like Barney, Glenno, uh, all these boys that have that have got all these cool stories. Uh, mm. And then we've had people on from, you know, uh, Clay from Method Race Wheels and, um, you know, the uh, Dan from Carbon and, and these guys because yeah. it's inter- industry stuff too. Yeah. yeah. You know, and I just didn't want it to be – that's why I called it Wild Side Garage because I didn't yeah. want to be pigeonholed or anything. No. Nah. You know, we just roll with the punches. That's good. It's how it should be. But um, to to wrap it up, because I know you've got uh, a, another appointment, uh, we've got a couple of things that we sort of we hit everybody up with. I'm going to add to yours cooking. Is that <laughs> was that you? Is that is that was that you sort of thinking like, oh, we need a we need a cooking segment on the show? Or? No, I was. That's how I. That's how they put me on the show. Um, if you look, if you there's a very early video where. I don't know, I, I think they were short on footage or footage or something a bit genuine, I don't know. Yeah. And they got this bearded bloke cooking on a bunch of milk crates out the back of a little old green Toyota. So um, so I quickly worked out that if I wanted to be in front of the camera, I had to cook a bit outrageous. So, right. And... Um, and I did, and I love cooking. I'm not allowed to cook at home, though, <laughs> I should say, because I make too much mess. Yeah. But in the bush, you know, yeah. I love a good cook-up. Oh, some of, some of the rest of it. Well, I've tried some of them. 
um, I've I've made notes. You know, when when you've gotten to the uh, end of it, I've gone, fuck, I reckon that'd be all right. <laughs> I've had a crack at a couple of them. Best best thing I've ever seen, like personal, what do you call it, accolade or something, you know, yeah. when you think, hey, I, I did something good here. Uh, years ago we had a, uh, in the magazine they had a Ruthie face and they had a competition going for something and um, and people would hold this page up, you know, had eye holes and it was my face yeah. and, and then they'd get photographed in Paris or out the back of somewhere or whatever, you know, where's Ruthie it was called. And yeah. Anyway, the winners were a couple of squadrons or platoons, I think they call them, of um, blokes, soldiers in Afghanistan who all held their Ruthie faces because yeah. they used to watch our videos, DVDs overseas. They used to love them because it was a touch of Australia. Yeah, a bit of home. You know, a bit of home. And, yeah. and most of those guys, if, if they've been seeing a bit of action, PTSD, T or whatever it's called, they'd come home, they go camping, that was as good as it got. Yeah. So they, they we were pretty... Popular with that, and um, anyway, there's all these blokes, and they did a. Uh, they actually filmed a whole clip with one of them with three or four pillows under his shirt <laughs> and a stick on Ruthie face, and the, the whole audience is full of soldiers with these Ruthie faces, and they're all going bang it in, Ruthie, bang it in, and he's putting a tin of Milo in and a <laughs> tin of beans and a tin of this and a tin of that. And, oh, it's great, you know. And come and taste it, and the first bloke up. You know, and it was just, I thought, wow, if that's in, if people enjoy that, that's great. Yeah. You know, you've done all right. Yeah. I like cooking. I yeah. like eating. It's pretty obvious. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, like, hey, look, I'm the same. I'm the same. I've been, I've been cutting back for a little bit, but. Um, uh, mate, when you get off the tools, that's when you start putting on weight. Get off the yeah. smokes. Well, you probably never smoked. No, no, no. I was, I was a pack to two pack a day for well, yeah. 30 years till December, uh, October last year. Well done. Yeah, that was. I'm still. I'm fucking still rocking the patches. Yeah, yeah. Because right. as soon as I have a beer, bang. Well, oh, no. I want one, but I'm. I'm. I've. I've upgraded now. So the we, cigars. Yeah, we have a cigar that. every now and then, and that's that's enough. Because okay. it's not like I don't wake up in the morning and go, God, I could go a cigar. <laughs> but one smoke the night before, I wake up in the morning wanting to smoke. Yeah, I know. No. I know. I was a smoker. Rollies too, but um, you know, in the bush, that was your company a lot of the time. You know, well, you're never bored when you've got smokes. No, you're never bored. You're you can always go for a smoke. You always sit there and just have a think. Yep. But um, I don't know where I was going with that, but as soon as I stopped smoking, I'll put on weight. Yeah, yeah, because you start eating everything. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then I sort of, Glenno pretty much got me off the tools very slowly and it'll happen to you one day too, you know. Yeah. And that's when this podcast will be awesome for you because you'll be able to do more of this and less of the tools. It, it yeah. happens. It happens. It's just a natural part of your life at... Sometimes it happens when you're in your 40s, 50s, whatever. Yeah. But, you know, um, I'm still on the tools, of, but it's all bike stuff now. I did my last Toyota gearbox about six years ago. Yeah, yeah. And it nearly killed me. And I just thought, right, I'm not doing this again, you know. I yeah. Got it stuck on that little dowel and everything turned to shit. The clutch wasn't in the right place. And, oh, and I was struggling away underneath it and screaming my head off to get my boys to come out of the house and come and give me a hand, you know. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, yeah. At the end of that, it was like, you know, carton of beer that night, I can tell you. Just oh, to, yeah. Uh, and I'm not doing that again. No, so. that's, when, that's when you're like, fuck, I'm, just, I'm glad there's yeah. no cameras. <laughs> <laughs> uh. so a lot of times I was glad there was no cameras, I can tell you. What's, um, I'll finish it off for you because I know you got to go, but the no cameras, no editing, no no sales pitch, no nothing. Where are you going? Beach or bush? Just for you. Oh. Um, look, that's like being asked, where's your favourite place? Mm. You know, it's the one you went to last time. Yeah. And I'm going on a beach holiday with the family, four-wheel driving. That's the next holiday. Um, the one after that will be in the outback, so... I love it all, to yeah. be honest. You know what I don't like is crowds yep. and um, more and more it bothers me. I think it's a, a, an old Australian thing, you know, um, maybe not even Australian. I think a lot of people feel this, but I first came to Queensland chasing a girl when I was 17. I went to Wynnum, which used to be called the Mud Flats, and it was just a little town. There was 900,000 people. That's 50-something years ago. There was 900,000 people in Queensland. 
In Queensland? In Queensland. Jeez, right. And now there's four and a half or five million just in this little corner. Yeah. The Gold Coast, you know, you'd back your ute up onto the beach, get your esky out, sit there, have a few beers, eat some prawns, whatever. Yeah. Now you can't even get close. No. You've got Green Mount, you've got buildings, you've got this, that. So I guess the older I get, the more I crave no, no people. Yeah. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Uh, oh, we're like that now. It's one of those things like even with this and because and my, my lady's, um, you know, she deals with uh, like that work insurance stuff like kind of like, like if you hurt yourself. You, oh, that, workers' comp what, type stuff. That type stuff, yeah. yeah. And, you know, and, and, and for me here as well with, with customers and stuff like that, and it's like there's definitely a part of that where, you know, when you, when you go home or you go away, you want to turn off because you're on mm. so much. Yep. It's like that's one of the parts that I still love about the workshop is I'll shut the doors. When I've had enough, I'll just shut the doors and I'll do what I'm doing in there. I'll crank the radio, you know, weld and grind and cut and whatever we're doing, even sand and stuff. And just, yeah, you're on your own. You yeah. Get, yeah. No, I, I get it. I mean... I have phone-free days, yeah. you know. Then yeah. I get into trouble with the wife because it's <laughs> nearly always the day she wants something. But, yeah. you know, you've got to. Yeah. You've just got to cut off. You've got to um, recharge the batteries. I want to finish this. Okay. I want to say two things. First yeah. of all, I've seen the quality of your work and I've seen your imagination. Yeah. You're really good at this stuff, mate. You might not have a piece of paper, but if you choose to do nothing else except play with cars and bikes, you're going to do real well. I think you're going to do better than that. I appreciate that. But the second thing is, when you're running your show, urge people to get out there and have a look because the biggest thing that's happened with urbanisation is people are scared to go bush, you know? Um, once they've been a few times, they're not. But yeah. the first time, it's such an alien environment to people who have always been connected on the phone, uh, to people... I've been bush with quite a few people over the years who haven't driven on a dirt road. Um, yeah. You get this, you know, and yeah. more and more we're going to get this. And so what we need to do, there's two things we need to do. One is we need to keep the bush alive. So don't buy your stuff at Aldi or Costco and jam it in your freezer, your 300 litre angle or whatever you've got and, and go bush. Don't do that. Shop at country bushes shop at country stores. I do all my, you know, work shirts, jeans, everything in the country. Yep. Shove some money into the country. You'll keep it alive. Next time you go there, you can get fuel. We need to encourage people, you need to, I need to, encourage people to go bush. Keep the place alive because what's happening out there now, I went to a field day up in Mackay a while ago, um, computerised tractor driving. You know, so my old job as a harvester... Wow. Before long, one guy in an office with a laptop will be controlling six, ten harvesters. They're already doing it with ploughing on the cotton. Um, they're doing it with trains in Western Australia. And before long, and every time that happens, that's another family that moves out of the area. Yeah. And the rich people send their kids to schools in the city. So you wind up with no life in the country. There's no young teachers, there's no schools, there's no post office. More and more country towns are realising they need to open an area up. You know, um, uh, Texas, down near Stanthorpe's a good example, you know. The, they, they were just, the t population was down to about 1,200, which wouldn't support a school, you know. No. And all of a sudden, uh, the shops were closing, things are sort of going bad, it's all big farming. And so they opened up the whole river to free camping, put in a toilet block. Now there's, you know, 100 caravans and tents and whatnot there most weekends. It's beautiful. Yeah. But that money coming in keeps the town alive. Keeps yeah, no, jobs. I agree. So. I agree. So, uh, yeah, that's a mission for you, mate. I'm passing the baton. There you go, Ben. There's the baton. You get people in the bush. Mate, I'll, I'll do what I can. And if you're ever, if you're ever doing anything and you need, a, you need a, another extra pair of hands, hey, fuck, we'll come and do some dishes. We don't care. Hey, we'll mate. come away on the trip. No, 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 you're too skilled for that. I'm, <laughs> I'm bringing my bike tank over, the one I bodged up. I'm going to bring it over here. <laughs> yeah, no, we'll have, a, we'll have a play with that. We'll have a play with that. <laughs> You'll like that. There's some nice shapes in it. Good on you. Nice. Well, Thanks, I appreciate Pete. your time, mate, and I know you've got to go, so thank you very much for spending the, a couple of couple of minutes with us. Uh, uh, good on you. are going to have to do it one afternoon when you can have a beer, though. 
<laughs> hey, hey, when you, not a when problem. You, when you can, uh, when you can chill out for a little bit. But I, I really appreciate your time and, and thanks for sharing some of that with us. You've just awesome. heard if I get pissed, I'm easy. <laughs> yeah, I know. I admit, you know. I admit nothing. <laughs> thanks, Ben. Oh, thanks, buddy. Bye, everybody. See ya. <laughs>